Inflammation is a, it's a complex process that, or, or series of processes that occur in the body. And the goal of inflammation is basically to deal with insults. I'll call them insults because that's what the medical um, world refers to injury and illness and, and that sort of thing, infection deal with insults and then begin the process of cleaning things up and then beginning to heal and repair. So we all know, and we're all familiar with inflammation and its, and its characteristic signs. So if you think about if you were hit by a golf ball on your thigh, you, you would pretty quickly notice an area of redness. It would be swollen, it would be hot, um, it would be painful and it would, depending on where, where it was, it would affect the function. So they're the five characteristics of, of inflammation. And I guess there's um, the other way to think about it is the, the, you know, how do we get inflammation? It's basically there are chemical messengers in the body which trigger the movement of cells and fluid and, and also co-opting the blood vessels to release certain things to create those five characteristics that I mentioned. The, the, so inflammation is essential. It's necessary. Without it, we die. So it's, it's absolutely crucial in how we handle things like cuts and abrasions and infections and, and precancerous changes in our body and that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a um, uh, it's a bit of a, a misnomer or a misunderstanding to think that inflammation is bad. It's not bad. It's absolutely fundamental to our survival. The problem occurs when inflammation is dysregulated or inappropriate. A classic example of that, the, so the best example I can give you is anaphylaxis. What can we do? What's in our hands on the epigenetic side of things? So we've got the genetic coding that mm. can't be changed. And mm. then you have lifestyle and you have epigenetics. And you have yeah. um, a, a, you know, a number of things that are now available and understood since we've done the gene testing, since we've done mm. all of that research. And certainly, um, you know, in our conversation earlier, we were saying that, you know, the pandemic has opened up the doors for people to be curious and invested in their own personal mm. health journey. I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. So I'm a, I'm a avid uh, baseball fan and um, so, sorry if I go a little bit off track here, but in, in baseball, what, what happens is um, early in the season, a, a particular baseball team, and I follow the Yankees, they, they'll look at, at how many wins and losses they've had. And what they'll do is they'll project out what it looks like the team is going to have won and lost by the end of the season. So they project out, looks like the Yankees are going to win 93 games this year. Okay. And of course, things happen along the way and they change the, they change the trajectory and, and so forth. And I, I actually think about lifespan and wellness in exactly the same way your 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 genetics and your environment basically combine to give you a trajectory of how long and how well you're going to live in my view so let's suppose the average life expectancy in australia today is about 80 80 to 85 depending on whether you're a man or a woman um, and you can, there are things that will negatively affect your trajectory that will actually make it that you might not make it to the average lifespan. And there are things you could do to increase your longevity and wellness, which is of course what we're talking about. If I'm honest, I think, I think COVID and, the, and, and all of the associated lockdowns and restrictions and mental health issues um, have, had a, have had a real impact on people's trajectory. And I think really? all of us, oh, I, I'm absolutely convinced 
So you and think I, that down the track we're going to see a, a marker, which was this 18 months, two years in, you know, the history of humanity. I do. That, that is actually going to negatively impact our life. I do. Wow. I do. And not I from really the disease, did. but from the from what happened to us. Exactly. I really, really, really do believe it. But I also believe that there are things we can do to tip it back in our favour to get back up towards 93 wins for the season. And so there, there are things that definitely give us a hit to our wellness and our longevity. We know, for instance, that loneliness is a massive factor. It's, it's huge when it comes to life expectancy. Um, and as I said, chronic inflammation, chronically high cortisol levels in the body can cause a reduction of lifespan. Sleeping less, insomnia and other associated conditions um, can lead to reduction of lifespan and wellness. Do, have you studied or are you interested in that field of nootropics and um, what you can do um, with the brain and mm. um, supplementation for cognitive health, um, memory, brain fog, performance? Mm. Great question. Yes, I am interested. I'm very. I'm. I'm interested in all of this stuff. Me too. We like, all like, are. Like you, I want to I wanna think more clearly. I want to perform better. I want to look better. I want to live longer. I mean, that's the goal, right? And, of course, how you think and, and you know, that's so fundamental with, with so many of us now, more and more of us thinking, thinking for a living, but all of us need to think clearly. No matter, even, if, even if you're a gardener uh, for a living or, or a painter and decorator, you still need to think more clearly. And when you do think clearly, you, you feel better. So I'm absolutely interested in nootropics. I confess I've tried a bunch myself. Um, I, have, you yeah, found, um, have you found some success in that space particularly? I'm really interested in the um, uh, mushrooms and, uh, yeah. and what they're doing in that space. It's really interesting to me and I'm playing around in that area myself. I'm excited. Indeed. Indeed. So, so I need to I need to basically put up a signpost here to say that um, there is a difference between what I do for myself and what I recommend for my patients. Yes, yeah, sure. What I rec what I recommend for my patients is evidence based. There's research behind it. There's safety and tolerability data behind it, and that, and there's net benefit when you weigh up all the studies that have been done. For myself, I have a much lower bar, okay? So if, if there's the possibility that chaga mushrooms will improve how I think and feel, I'm gonna try them because I think to myself, it's a mushroom extract. How bad could it be, mm. all right? Other people are taking it. And I know that's what most people do. They, you, you go on a bit of social proof, um, yeah, this, you know, there's a few good reviews and so on and so forth. So I definitely am interested in that space and I have experimented. I must confess, I haven't felt, I haven't personally felt much of a change and I, and I gave it a good go. Um, I gave it a good go with um, chaga mushrooms and, and other nootropics that I've tried, but I am actively monitoring the literature all the time to see if anything comes up. And, and to be fair, these studies are hard to do because the outcomes that they're trying to measure, are, it's very difficult. How could you quantify, how can you quantify clear thinking or- But you, know, you can measure difficult. memory, you can measure short-term, long-term memory. You can, memory. you can, um, you can. And I think, I think the other thing, of course, we need to, take into account is the placebo effect, which, which is real and, and can account for as much as 30% of any. And I don't mind the placebo effect. Absolutely. I mean... Absolutely. Completely agree. So I'm with you there. I think, um, and this is going to sound strange from a, a, a person that's got a supplement company, but I'm, I'm a bit 
pessimistic um, and skeptical about most supplements. And let me let me explain myself because I don't, I don't want to put my own company out of business. I'm I'm very deliberate about um, how I think about and talk about supplements. Can we improve our eye health and eye age? Is this is this a possibility that we can actually improve our eyesight? Well, I mean, outside of um, having outside of having your um, your prescription, because there's 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 a couple of sides to vision. There's the optics of your eye, and then there's the health of your eye. Yes. Now the I optics. Yeah, and the optics of your eye can obviously be, um, if they're not quite right, they can be remedied in almost all cases with a pair of spectacles or contact lenses. So you can optimize your vision with op with good optics, spectacles or contact lenses. And then the other side of the coin is the health of your eyes. And, and the goal really should be just to maintain the health of your eyes. It's, it's, probably, um, it's probably quite similar to maintain eye health as it is maintaining general health in that the, the principles are similar. We're trying to avoid poisoning this part of our body. We're trying to avoid inflammation in that part of the body. So it, the same principles <clears throat> that serve you well for, for your general health will tend to serve you well for the, for the health of your eyes. And will blue <clears throat> light affect the health of your eyes? It's a good question, and it's a really common one. Um, so most, most of that light is actually absorbed by the media of the eye. So right. most, most visible light, okay, or most invisible light is absorbed. So things like ultraviolet and infrared are absorbed by the tissues <clears throat> of the eye, the cornea, the lens, the liquid in the eye and so forth. Visible blue light obviously gets through, not all of it gets through, but some of it gets through. And we have receptors in the back of the eye that catch blue light specifically, that's their job. So there's a pigment in the cells at the back of the eye and the retina that absorb blue light, that's their job. Blue light therefore is not deleterious to our health, but there is some, there is some um, evidence that blue light can decrease the production of melatonin and thereby affect sleep regulation. <clears throat> so, I, so the evidence is not strong. There's certainly a lot more uptake of blue light blocking lenses than there is evidence for their use. I've, I've got a pair of blue light blocking lenses that I use to read before bed, because like most people now, I'm reading from a screen as opposed to a book and or a computer. And, and um, you know, I did so with the thinking that I'll just try and do whatever I can to improve my, my chances of sleeping well. Are there optimal levels? Because that's, that's the part where my brain explodes. Mm, good question. The, the interesting thing about turmeric and curcumin as you say it's been it's been used for thousands of years now in cooking and ayurvedic medicine interestingly it's really poorly absorbed you could eat you could eat a kilogram of turmeric and most of it will pass through you without so much as a skerrick of it getting into your blood and therefore wow. getting to the place that it's needed so what we've managed to do is improve its bioavailability that is the amount that reaches the bloodstream um, by in a in a very natural way so without heat or chemicals by through through our formulation um, and and the use of other ingredients we're able to improve bioavailability by a thousand times and that means it gets into the blood. So it's not really, it's not so much about 
dose because what's more important is bioavailability. And the, and the, the key point is um, that even in high doses, curcumin is safe. You're very unlikely to ever get too much curcumin into your body. 